Many of you may not have seen this little lady, Marinelle Harriman. A lot of you are, are newer rather than older members. Marinelle is the person who, along with a group of friends in California many years ago, started the House Racing Society. And, and one of those friends was her husband, Bob, who has worked collaboratively this entire time and who is here today as well. He probably should be standing up here, but he's getting out of it. And he's right there. I guess that's her best friend. Um, and Margot just asked me if I would come up and just kind of chat with Marinelle and have like a conversation. So, because Marinelle's really shy and um, <laughs> she doesn't like to talk about herself, and yet she's a hero in, in all of our eyes, I think, for what she's done and for what the organization has grown into. So, um, I'm going to ask her some questions that occur to me, and I hope if you all have questions that I don't think of, I hope you'll raise your hands and ask her questions that occur to you about the history of the House Rabbit Society. So, and I shouldn't be saying the House Rabbit Society because the official name is House Rabbit Society with no the. So excuse that, it's a bad habit, <laughs> sorry. Um, I don't know a lot about the early days because I'm from New York and this all started in California and there are people here who were involved in its inception, uh, like Beth Woolbright, whom I just saw, and some Mar Margo, and some other people. They may have more to add, too, but Marinella was kind of the beginner of, of everything. How did that happen? How come you were the beginner? Where did that start? It started with a small rabbit, a black and white rabbit, hopping through our backyard. And I had no idea what it was. I thought maybe a cat or maybe you know, something. But I went out and saw that it was a bunny. And you had no rabbits of your own? Nothing. I had no concept of what we were going to do. So I brought the bunny in and tried to figure out what we were going to do with it. And my husband came in from work and said, um, well, don't tell the kids not to expect too much because, you know, rabbits don't uh, have that much uh, personality. Or brains. <laughs> and so he was going to build a hutch in the backyard until we could find the owner. And it turns out the hutch was never built. And Herman, who we thought was a boy, turned out to be a girl, <laughs> but she took over our house in the next um, six months. She you know, was everything that all first bunnies that people cherish, you know, she was that. Then when we lost her, not knowing a good diet, not knowing good care, not knowing all the things that we know today, that everybody is able to avoid. When we lost her, we were so devastated. Mm -hmm. And I started this uh, therapy to write the Hass Rabbit Handbook because I thought um, the only way I could heal was to do something positive in her name and make her memory continue on. And so that's why I started writing it. Once a week, I would uh, interview people who had, and uh, I'll back up. We had um, a few pet supply stores in the Bay Area. I put up a little notice asking people to respond if they had a rabbit who lived in the house with them. Oh. And so Beth responded, and um, a few of the others who were the first res responders on this, um, on this plea, and um, found out that I wasn't alone. I wasn't the only one who ever had a bunny who lived in the house and that we loved terribly. And two years later, well, uh, say after the book came out, and then we got this response from people all over the country. I thought, well, that's really unusual. We bought a mailing list and just mailed out flyers thinking nobody would care about a rabbit living in the house. And what and year was this that you This was 1985. And so the book got out, and it was much more than we thought it would be as far as a response. Then I had people writing and saying, please uh, uh, do a magazine. Or then uh, uh, we got a call from Amy Espy, who was one of the first, right, first rescuers and uh, par participant in the House Rabbit Handbook. 
And um, a friend of hers told us that the Oakland SPCA was going to be euthanizing four rabbits the next day. And I said, well, what are you telling me this for? You know, nothing I can do about it. And she said, well, you go get them. <laughs> that never occurred to me. And I called Bob at work, and I said, oh, there's four rabbits at the, rabbit, at the um, Oakland SPCA, and they're going to be euthanized tomorrow. And he said, well, we can't let that happen, can we? <laughs> so he told me to go get them. I went and got them. And that was the beginning of rescue. In the early days, we thought we were going to save them all because it was so much fun. You know, we found homes for these rabbits. We ran an ad in the paper. We don't know if they were, right. we hope they were good homes, but we didn't know anything about screening. But we did interview the people who came. And as we started doing this, our veterinarian at the time said, you know, you're going to rescue these little guys anyway, and you love them dearly. Why don't you start a nonprofit? You know, at least you can get some support for what you're doing. So that's when we called back in the people who had helped with the House Rabbit Handbook and said, hey, you want to come and be on the board and be on the um, um, first uh, incorporators of the House Rabbit Society? And so that's how it evolved. It's uh, just an informal um, Beth Woolbright who is here. And, um, now, the first, um, right after we got incorporated, we started sending out the House Rabbit Journal to the people who had bought the House Rabbit Handbook. We thought, well, this would be a good, good place to start. And so they responded and with their memberships and so on, and we sent a, the journal to veterinarians, and we put them in their lobbies, and that actually, I think, the first... Um, Respondents from veterinary was from New York, so we got our first members of the House Rabbit Society um, back then. That's 1980. And I actually think, where's Laura George? Is she still here? Laura, where are you? Were you were you one of those first people? You were very early on in New York, right? Yeah. Laura was. Yeah. 89. 89. Yeah. I talked to Laura when she was in California before she moved to New York. So um, that's goes a long way back there, too. Mm -hmm. Then we had um, um, Susan Stark, who's back there, was one of our, I think Where's she Susan? was my, Susan? way back Can there you, in the corner. Susan here. Stark, if everybody wants to see a very early member here. She was my first, uh, what do you call it, satellite foster. And then Margo came in 1989, and she was my second satellite foster. And um, things just took off after that. You know, they're, um, all I can say over the years is that we accidentally started something that we're very proud of and we're so happy that it happened, but it's the next people who came up and stepped up to the plate and started doing everything that made it all possible. I mean, it wouldn't be great as today if it hadn't been for all the wonderful volunteers who came along and took it to the next level. All that's true, but we want to know about you today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have a couple of questions right away. When you okay. said Herman, took, did you rename Herman Hermione or anything like that? I tried to, but she already knew her name. Okay. And she, so when she was called, you know, she said, Herman. And, she, and you said she took over, well, her. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So <laughs> she said, you said she took over your home for six months. Right. Was that all she lived at that point? Did she live only six months? No, no, two years. She lived two, two oh, years okay. with you. No, it only took her six months to... To take uh, over the home. To, yeah, so we thought we were going to keep her in the kitchen. We put newspapers down all over. Then I noticed that, oh, she was only using one newspaper. Well, you know, so, maybe that litter box for a rabbit? You know, that just seemed very uh, unheard of. So I thought, well, if she's only going in the one place, maybe a litter box. You know, and this isn't like a parallel universe. I had exactly the same experience in New York, um, where I adopted a rabbit from some nefarious person, and, um, and I, I couldn't bear to put him in a cage. I put him in my kitchen, and he kept using one corner. Yeah. So I thought, gee, what would happen if I put a box in the corner? The same thing. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's really weird. Same time, same era, and yeah. across the country. I guess it was a move, like a serendipitous kind of yeah, synchronous movie that started. So did you ever, in those days, did you ever think about getting a companion for Herman? It never occurred to us. Did, well, did he seem okay by himself? 
Well, she <laughs> left the kitchen. <laughs> she left the kitchen and headed right to our bed. And she slept with us at night. And she bounced around and did binkies and you know everything. She took a little. Do you have any idea how old she was? Well, she was you know, a youngster when I found her in the backyard. She was yes. and still growing. Still growing. So tell me about house destruction. <laughs> oh, she a few or as people call it, interior <laughs> desecration. Right. <laughs> a few phone cords. Phone cords? Yeah. Back then there really weren't computers like there are now. We had computers. For us, there weren't. Actually, yeah. the early days of the journal, we relied very heavily on the uh, computer. In fact, this is before we had internet or email yeah. and everything was by phone or you know, what we could put in the mail, and so we had to, um, getting that house rabbit journal out was really important to us. And what's really nice now is that the, the continuity, Bob and I did it ourselves for the first 20 years. I published it. The first 20 years. And then um, and we had a wonderful staff. Beth has been on it all the time. And now, this last year, we have handed it off to a new team of uh, journal editors and, uh, and it's continuing. So it doesn't have to be us. It doesn't live and die with us. It, just, it will go on and that's, that's what we were hoping for. That everything that has been started will continue. And so, seeing all the chapters around, you know, that, and especially this one. Yes. Yeah, it's so gratifying. So what was the most surprising thing to you about having a rabbit in your house? Did people criticize you for it? Were you renting the house from a landlord? Yes, that, yes. That you were. Yeah. Did your lease prohibit pets? Or? Yes. It did. <laughs> did your landlord ever find out or make a surprise no. plumbing visit? No, or by the time we moved, we had 82 rabbits. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, In this house, this rented yes, house. Yes. Did your landlord house. find out? And uh, our landlady's mother in law lived next door. <laughs> and we were so careful. So you couldn't have kept it secret for that long, could you? We did. You did? We did. They never came in to inspect or nothing? No, so we were lucky. How many years we did you re-sign that lease that they didn't know you had 82 rabbits? Um, we didn't re-sign the lease, it was month to month, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the only reason we were evicted was because the landlady was selling, uh, not selling, it, giving the house to her uh, daughter oh. for a wedding present. Did they see you move 82 rabbits out when you left? No, we slipped them out in the night. <laughs> yes. Who did it? Did you do it yourself? The whole group did? Yeah, our family. We got it. Well, there's something else. I, I have heard this phrase a lot, um, and it's sitting around a kitchen table. Yes. Everybody talks about the early days as a group of friends sitting around. That's what was right. that about? Okay, um, Beth, uh, Betty Subamoto, who's no longer here, Amy Espy, who passed away a couple of years ago. Um, what was his name? Ron uh, Westman. Ron Westman and uh, his wife. Bianca Boyd. <laughs> I can't remember her name. But anyway, we sat around our dining table and just talked, and uh, we had kept in touch ever since the House Rabbit Handbook. So then when it, it was time to start this organization, we just um, got the same people to come together and, and uh, be signers. And how did the idea of chapters come to you, or, or did it come to somebody that else? Later, I think Beth was heavily involved in uh, developing the criteria for chapters, and then when Margo came in, she got everything really organized, and we set up some rules and things like that, and we saw an attorney for the first time, because I was getting kind of scared that maybe we weren't doing this all right, and, um, and she said, you know, the larger you grow, the more rules you have to make, and so that seemed kind of scary, we had to make rules, and I was amazed at Margo because she would have people actually have to uh, sign applications to become a, an educator. And when I was doing, you know, heading the organization, I was just so grateful for anybody who was going to show up and volunteer that I accepted everybody's help for, for any reason whatsoever. Why risk losing them with an uh, yeah, application? I didn't want to 
Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. And so uh, uh, Marco set some standards and, and uh, set up some applications. I thought she's not going to have anybody volunteering. <laughs> 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 and it was great, you know, because people then you know, thought if they have to fill out an application, that means that it's worth something. Serious. Yeah. It's worth yeah. something. So, uh, and how did you deal with, I mean, back in those days, there weren't rabbit vets. And how did you deal with, with getting rabbit veterinary care? We, we had a good rabbit vet. Yeah. Um, Dr. Marlis Geisler was the first person we knew of that had um, that did, took care of rabbits, saw rabbits. And then going to work at the same hospital was Dr. Carolyn Harvey. She was fresh out of school, I think, at that time. And she, um, we thought of her as the brainy new veterinarian who uh, was kind of aloof, but then, but, <laughs> but she, she, was very, she was very smart. So we thought, well, you know, she solves problems. And then over the next two or three years, she just became our vet, our go-to vet, warm and friendly and solved problems and talked. She thought out loud, and that was re really important to us because instead of, you know, going off into another room and and taking the money and not telling us anything about it. She would think about all these things and out loud, and out loud yeah. so we could participate. So was she, was she or anybody you were working with collaborative in the sense of in, interested in your input? Yes, absolutely. She's been great all these years. And the other thing that she has done is recruit other vets yeah. to, uh, to help us. And then she was very instrumental in getting the the veterinary conference going in 1996. I, yeah, I remember that, yeah. And what were some of the early days, what were some of the hurdles that, that you had to overcome? Or did you ever at some point think, damn, what have I started? I can't keep doing this. I would have times that I would feel pretty overwhelmed with the amount of work. Yeah. And that was the time when I thought I, I had to do it all. And I didn't know how to delegate. And that was what the next people coming, that's what Margo was great at, you know, delegating and getting um, other people to do work. And I thought I had to do it all, and I couldn't uh, leave the house unless all the work was done. And so that, that was letting go, having to, to do that, was, that was hard. And what would you so consider you know, some milestones? I know that starting the organization, then starting the House Rabbit Handbook, I mean, publishing the House Rabbit Handbook, starting the House Rabbit Journal, those are three huge milestones. What are some other things that you might consider milestones? Well, getting the money together to do a, a shelter in uh, Richmond. You know, and how long did that take? That took, uh, let's see, we had a fundraiser in 19, let's see, our 10th anniversary, we had a fundraiser and we put the money in the bank to work towards it. So, um, let's see, we got the shelter in it was a similar story to what's going on here, uh, but we didn't get as good a building as as uh, yeah, this building here. Is <laughs> we don't have as much um, acres. Oh, well, gee, they, our um, the rabbit center in uh, Richmond is like three thousand square feet. Mm -hmm. The one here in uh, St. Louis is five thousand square feet. So I mean, that's yeah. a, that's a real find. But we were lucky at the time. You know, we had to we had to break some ground on. After getting the uh, building we wanted, then it was the stigma of rabbits, you know, farm animal, and you know, what were the neighbors going to do? It's a residential neighborhood, and how are how are they going to accept us? And and we had to jump through a lot of hoops. Did you? Did your neighbors and, complain or ever try to turn no, you? No, we thought they were going to complain, and so um, we had to present our case to the city council. Maybe Marco remembers some of this because you were at some of those meetings that... Uh, I was, um, but you guys, were, I think, are the ones who put the presentation together. Yeah, uh, Bob awesome. put the presentation together, a, a graphic saying the handouts, and you know, we tried to make it sound real, real good. But you were kind of pessimistic. You didn't think those neighbors liked us at all. Um, and then it turned out, you know, after we left... That well, we were better than the prostitutes. <laughs> that they had voted unanimously to let us into the neighborhood. So we got the use permit. 
And you did, so we had a zoning? Yes, it was a, a zoning. zoning yeah, okay. Similar to what they've had to do here. Okay. You know, get, get the, uh, it's a residential neighborhood. Right. So you have to get everything so redone. And then it kind of metastasized from there. Yes, and uh, it, it, um, it, with the help of the internet and the, all the stuff that's online, yeah. and uh, getting that all organized and up, up into them. So the chapter, and what I see now is that all the chapters have a, a good network, and there's so much cooperation. Somebody, you know, needs help over here, and somebody over there can yeah. uh, come to rescue. It's like a big and network. Spread rabbits around for needed, and so on. Well, um, I would love to hear some questions from people here, but she said one, ten, minutes. One, ten, minutes. 10 minutes, yeah. One last question, if you would mind mentioning something about the, the health database. I know that was a huge milestone for you at some point, starting and, and uh, getting that up and running. Well, actually, Dr. Harvey um, put together what would be the fields and so on. I've got it up to a point, but... Could you tell people what it is? Because there's a lot of new people here, I think, that don't know about it. We're going to actually have a presentation on that's, that. That's okay. what I thought, so yeah. Dr. Marinell, then we're going to have just a very brief, uh, just the board members. Good, to okay. And then Stephen, who is a San Diego House Heritage Society volunteer, has run with the health database that Marinell created and has uh, taken it to a point where hopefully it'll be We can go online. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think we're going to have a talk about that in yeah. just a few minutes. Good. Okay, so in the eight or nine minutes we have left, maybe other people would... Yes, go ahead. Uh, when was the first House Rabbit Society journal? When, when was, was the it? first House Rabbit Society journal? 1988, May of 1988. Thank you. And we would love to get them all online at some point. Margo and I have been talking about that right, recently. Right, right. I've, yeah. I've been... Uh, I'm behind. I'm That's sure. okay. <laughs> other questions? So if anybody here is a history buff or loves doing that kind of thing, Margo would love to talk to you. I would love to talk about that. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. How did you decide to go global or get, you know, affiliated with like United Kingdom and you know, expand globally? That just gradually evolved after we found that we could um, I think when Beth was still working on, uh, you were the education director at that time, and we had people who would call, everything was by phone then, you know, we didn't have the internet, but they um, would call, and I'd say, oh, you're calling from Florida, you know, we could, could we list you as a contact for people, you know, in Florida to, you know, um, they need help with their monies. So we had a few uh, around, and we put that on a little brochure, and uh, pretty soon the contact list got bigger and bigger, and it wouldn't fit on the brochure anymore. And fortunately, the internet came along, and we could just in time, that. right? Yeah, just in time. Other questions? I know I saw a hand over here. So yes. When did you decide to start the state and neutering rabbits? Because I know that. Oh, Beth was instrumental in that. <laughs> she had her her first rabbit, Patrick, uh, neutered. And he was boarding with us at the time. And of course, it, yeah, he was boarding. And, she, um, and he survived it. <laughs> and so at first, we were only neutering the males. We didn't know that females should be spayed for a couple of years. And then we realized that you know, all the um, possibilities of cancer, and uh, it's just better to not risk having them reproduce after they were adopted and somebody would get an unneutered male. So it, um, that kind of grew. But it started with Beth neutering Patrick. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Curiosities. Yes? Where would you like to see the organization go in the next 10 years? I would love for every chapter to do exactly what this chapter has done. Yes. <laughs> In New York, we need a grant of about three thousand five—I mean, three million five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so let's start working. On that. 
How about yeah. how about a comment about the global associations we have now? I think it's Singapore. Yeah. When we have and let's see, Lori um, Gigas. Um, I think she approves new educators and uh, gets people. Uh, where's Lori? I don't see her here now. But, um, yeah, I can. Singapore. Singapore, yeah. Canada. Australia, a couple of years back. Yeah. Uh, Australia, don't we have a... a Australia, yeah. um, Hong Kong. Um, I think we've got somebody from the UK applying right now. Anyway, the international is kind of exploding right now. Mm -hmm. So it is really exciting. Yes. Uh, sorry, I have a question about the... The question was, is there any possibility to have things translated into other languages? Yes. Yes. I think, please, let's talk about it. Okay. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I'm personally writing some uh, article in Japanese erotic commercial book, and uh -huh. I'm introducing the HLS. And uh -huh. everyone really is surprised because the yeah. whole knowledge in Japan about erotic is different from HLS. Yeah. <laughs> so I really We actually have been doing that. I know Margot and I correspond periodically to get people um, plugged into translating. We get either requests for translations or we get offers for translations, yes. which has been. Yeah, are you the one that I was corresponding yeah, I, with? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've done that for a couple of years, yes. I um, just blog for erratic, it's a whole thing. But um, I, my erratic <laughs> has a huge following in Japan. I mean, huge. Your blog does? In my guess. In book. English, your English book. Yes, it's wow. in English, but my English blogging rabbit has a huge following in Japan of Japanese rabbits who correspond with. How do you spell Arliss? A-R-L-I-S-S. -S. Okay. I mean, there's a book. Okay, we're being told our time is up, but now everybody can recognize our heroine. There I go.